Right, friends, we're in business once more. Um, we can spend a few minutes now discussing this whole understanding of the economy of saving grace if you have problems in understanding it that need to be ventilated. Are there problems? Yeah, right at the back there. Oh, <clears throat> um, question, what would the Puritans say about the possibility of an Arminian being saved or, by parity of reasoning, anyone else who denied some part of Puritan theology, right? Um, the answer is that the Puritan pastors were quite clear that some matters are primary and essential and some matters are secondary and you can be wrong about them without losing your salvation. Primary and essential is a proper focus on Jesus Christ as the object of faith and repentance and discipleship. Without that, no one can be saved, even if he's an orthodox Calvinist in his confession. With that, well, you're a believer and you will be saved, even if your notions about some of the um, details of Puritan theology are mistaken. The pastors and the theologians, I think, are consistently clear on that. Nobody is lost for lack of orthodoxy. People are only lost for lack of true faith in the real Christ. Is that answer enough? Well, mm -hmm. the Puritan position there is that unorthodoxy in the mind uh, doesn't necessarily produce unorthodoxy or lack of uh, a proper attitude or commitment in the life, although it may do. Uh, the Puritans would say that if an Arminian has real faith and is saved, it is despite the deviations of uh, his doctrine from the, um, Augustinian, the Augustinian benchmark rather than because of them. Every bit of unorthodoxy in the mind makes some um, proper faith and a proper faith commitment more difficult. But Arminians do believe in the divinity of Christ, in the incarnation, in the uh, atoning significance of Christ's death, in the reality of his resurrection and his heavenly ministry and intervention in the interests of those who look to him. Arminians, um, in other words, are quite sound enough with regard to Jesus Christ to be saved. Now, does that, does, does that answer your concern? Okay. Uh, perhaps I may add that um, uh, I believe that um, it's right-minded 
for reformed people today to take the same attitude and be very careful that they maintain the distinction between what's primary and what's secondary in Christianity and that they don't treat people who are with them on the primary things as enemies because they're not fully agreed with them on the secondary things. Uh, I say that because historically, as perhaps you know, both Calvinists and Arminians have been, I think, scandalously combative, each writing off the other holus bolus. Um, they are so wrong that they can't be sp they, they, they can't be spiritually right about anything, uh, so we shouldn't take them seriously as um, fellow believers or anything like that. Any more matters anyone wants to raise? Oh, sorry, sorry. Yes. Oh, wait a minute. Speak up because we want everybody at the back of the room to hear you and I want to hear you clearly too. You mentioned apostasy just now. Mm -hmm. I was wondering what would be Puritan reaction be to apostates, especially in the light of the Eden There is a... Uh, I'm asked about the Puritan view of apostasy and the first thing I say is that there's a full-scale treatise on apostasy presenting representative Puritan doctrine and dealing at great length with Hebrews 6. That's a treatise, the treatise is by John Owen and you find it in, I think, volume 6, maybe volume 7, but I think it's volume 6 of his collected works. And furthermore, it's summarized for you in chapter... Uh, chapter... Um, yes, chapter 10 pages 232 to 261 in Sinclair Ferguson's book John Owen on the Christian Life. Uh, having said that, what they affirm is that every Christian needs to be aware that apostasy happens to those who don't think they're going to apostatize um, they slip without realizing that they're slipping. Every Christian, therefore, needs to know the stages and the marks of the slow, steady slippage. And then with regard to the people who slip, well, they are described for us in Hebrews 6, verses 4 through 6, they're described in terms of having had a real spiritual experience which yet hasn't changed their heart so that they correspond to the stony ground hearers in Jesus' parable of the sower and I think I made that point briefly yesterday. Um, they receive the word with joy but they don't have any depth and when the sun comes up, well, They've no depth, no rootage, they wither away. Um, for the Christian, it's um, important to remember that uh, there will be apostates in the church and that um, they themselves can only be confident that they'll not be found among that number to the extent that they are intentionally, deliberately, self-consciously committing themselves to go flat out for their Lord in daily obedience and discipleship. Living each day to please the Master, um, living each day with the question, what is the best I can do for the glory of my Lord? Live in that spirit and you won't apostatize, said the Puritans. Um, ask the Lord to help you to live in that spirit of zeal for his glory on a daily basis, and he will answer your prayer. And that will keep you from apostasy. But uh, to, to take, take this matter seriously, they said, 
because, now I come back to where I started, the people who do apostatize are always people who never thought that that was what was going to happen to them. Is that enough of an answer to be going on with? I... real spiritual experience uh, it talks about real spiritual experience yes they've received the word with joy well it nowhere so, look we, we can't go into the detail of um, detail of the exegesis I refer you to Owen's treatise where he shows by careful study of the way words are used that nowhere in Hebrews 6 um, are we being told that the people who are envisaged as apostatizing were born again there's no language of new birth no language of regeneration no language of, being, of their being united with Christ in death and resurrection nothing as radical as that is said about them we talked yesterday about people who have some sort of spiritual experience uh, which does excite them and make you think at first that they're real converts and then you find afterwards that it all wears off so you draw the conclusion that they weren't real converts after all. As I said, Owen goes into the details um, tracing the use of words the words that are used in Hebrews 6, 4 through 6 um, and, and, and showing that uh, the significant thing here is what's not being said about them and now remember, remember that the letter to the Hebrews was written to a group of Jewish Christians who were having a hard time because of their faith it looks as if uh, the synagogue wanted them back and was making life very tough for them um, by uh, some measure of persecution because of their Christian profession and these people had got the idea that it might be rather smart to give up their Christian profession and go back to the synagogue because they'd lose nothing uh, they were after all Christ's and they would gain something that is freedom from persecution and the writer writes his letter in order to convince them that if they, give, if they give up their faith in Christ, they lose everything. There's no spiritual blessing for them um, in the synagogue because uh, Jewish observances are now empty. All of that has become a thing of the past because of the perfection of the new covenant um, under, Jesus, uh, under Jesus Christ, the better priest so they must at all costs hold fast uh, stay steady in their profession only so will they come to the final glory and it's in order to hammer home that point that you've got the description in chapter 6 verses 4 through 6 of people who um, despite all the spiritual experience they've had might fall away um, what the writer is really saying is look you, you may tell me that you've had wonderful spiritual experiences and I don't doubt that you have but if you fall away well there's nothing I can do to renew you to repentance uh, you will lose irrevocably because it's only through Christ that um, you gain eternal, gain eternal life and eternal glory so naturally he uses glowing language in talking about the experience that um, people who might fall away have had because he wants all his readers to feel hey well yes uh, that, that, that fits me and yet he says if you, if, if you uh, this is his meaning if you give up your faith in Christ you lose everything that's the ad hominem pastoral thrust of the letter to the, letter to the Hebrews we can't spend any more time talking about this but um, the Puritans see this very clearly and it's all, it's all actually in Owen's treatise on apostasy yeah just a couple of questions on uh, Perkins uh, golden chain 
Mm-hmm. Um, I think we were coming to the end of a session, and you were going to uh, comment on the left-hand column. Would you uh, be happy to help? Oh, yes, I was, and thank you for reminding me of that. In light of what I said to you earlier this morning about assurance, I don't think we shall find it hard to see what's going on in that left-hand column. Um, the pastoral problem with which the left-hand column deals is doubting of election. You see that in the top bubble, far left. Have you all of you got it? Um, Doubting of election, it's a state of mind. Yes, well, uh, we've been talking about it. Assurance is lacking. What's, uh, w w what precisely is the form of it that it takes? Well, go down the double line to the next bubble and you will begin to see. Um, the person who doubts his or her election is overwhelmed by the sense of the three things that are in that next bubble that he or she has been hearing the word preached unprofitably um, I've heard it and it doesn't seem to have done me any good uh, and so this person is on the edge of despair perhaps um, actually falling into despair and doubting the reality of his or her faith and then if you follow the double line down, doubting of the reality of one's justification goes along with that, and um, concupiscence of the flesh underneath that is something that the person in spiritual distress is very conscious of. Well now, what Perkins diagram is concerned to show that person is that, um, well, actually, uh, look, look down at the bot in the bottom left-hand corner and you'll see it half an inch up from the bottom of the page in the paragraph headed to the reader. The B lines descending likewise show the temptation, that means the temptations of the godly and the remedies. Uh, the B lines, you see them, uh, they're moving out in the right-hand direction towards um, elements in the saving work of God that the elect undergo. So what do you do? You doubt, if you're found doubting your election, then you look back, and your pastor must help you to look back, to the certainty of effectual calling which you appeared to have undergone um, because you've come to a profession of faith which at one time you thought and your pastor thought was real, was, um, re real and true. Um, if you were ever a true, uh, the, if you were ever truly committed to Christ in faith, then you were justified and you are being sanctified and um, you mustn't doubt your election when those things are happening to you. And if you feel, but I'm doing so badly in my Christian life, second bubble down, I'm hearing the word unpro unprofitably and I feel desperate about that, I can't believe that I am a real believer, well, remember that the justification that is given in the gospel is given to sinners. What is required of sinners is not that they is not that they bring to the Lord Jesus a track record of virtue, but that they bring him an acknowledgement of their spiritual need, their emptiness, their sinfulness. Their, dependent, their, their, their dependence on his grace and the knowledge that they will only ever live spiritually by being forgiven. If you come to Jesus Christ in faith, that's how it is and that's how it must ever be. pastor must tell them that. And um, you can see that there's a beeline from that second bubble down to the bubble 
labelled sanctification. Uh, the pastor is able to say to the troubled soul, look, I've watched you and I'm in a position to tell you, if you aren't in a position already to tell me, your life has been different since you became serious about Christ. Well, that prima facie is the beginning of God's work of sanctification. And that work of sanctification argues that uh, you are one of the elect and you really are in a state of grace and you shouldn't despair, you shouldn't give up hope. Um, you show signs of belonging to the Lord. And if you're very conscious of, next bubble down, concupiscence of the flesh, well, Christians are. We're, the next subject, actually, which I shan't get very far into today, is the subject of sanctification. That's the subject that uh, is titled The Good Fight uh, in the outline of topics, the syllabus that I gave you. Um, Christians become, the pastor will tell them, will say, very conscious of sin within them, battling the uh, spirit-given urge to righteousness, spiritual conflict, combat, warfare, becomes much more of a reality for the, for the Christian than ever it was, or is, for people who are not yet, who are not yet in Christ. So, what you've got here is um, the bit of the diagram that points to the way in which um, when the godly are tempted, uh, remedies, in terms, I mean, of pastoral counsel, are to be drawn from the realities of the gospel on the one hand and of the tempted soul's prior experience on the other, uh, in order to reassure and restabilize and encourage them. That's what's going on there. Okay? Could you just comment on the enemies of life of time? And how that goes straight across into life of time? Uh, yes. Um, I'm asked to comment on the bottom left bubble, enemies of life eternal. Uh, what, uh, what Perkins is um, referring to by that bubble is the um, opposition of the world, the flesh, and the devil to every believer. And the world, of course, um, it, how can I say, the world is a concept that branches out into all kinds of opposing and discouraging and hostile uh, life um, factors in life for um, every believer. Uh, I told you, I think, at the beginning of the course that the Puritan conviction was that nobody makes spiritual progress except against opposition, because the opposition is always there. Well, the enemies of life eternal are realities in the life of the troubled soul, and he'll constantly, he or she, will constantly be aware of them and, and under temptation will f be feeling, well, the, um, how does one say it, the opposition is so strong that I just can't carry on. To which the pastoral answer is to say, if you know that you've been effectually called, you've been justified, you're being sanctified, you are in covenant with God through Christ. He is your Savior, His Spirit indwells you, and so on and so on. You are, in other words, the recipient of uh, grace that can overcome all opposition. Then you won't give in, after all, to the enemies of life eternal. And you will know how to resist the temptation simply to throw in the towel and give up the battle. I'm putting it deliberately in general terms. Perkin puts it, Perkins puts it in general terms. Uh, each individual Christian meets the situation that, or situations that tempt them hardest to give up the battle. But no, says uh, Perkins, you mustn't do that. And um, he wants 
the teaching you see that comes out of this uh, diagram to be reassuring, comforting in the strong sense in which the Puritans used that word, and this is part of the comfort. This is the bottom line, so to speak, of the comfort. Keep going. The Lord is in your life and he's going to get you home. That's what's going on there. Okay? By the way, my brother mentioned Perkins' work um, titled A Golden Chain. This diagram doesn't come from a golden chain. It comes from another of his works. But the diagram does exhibit all the things that the work entitled A Golden Chain, that is a chain of principles about God's salvation, is actually de are actually dealing with. And you can find some of this in the collection of um, excerpts from Perkins that was put together donkeys years ago by Ian Breward, B-R-E-W-A-R-D, 40 years ago, I suppose. Um, and you'll find that in the library. William Perkins by Ian Breward. And there were enough extracts in that work from a golden chain to um, show you what's going on there. Any more from any more? Can I then have the last uh, ten minutes or so beginning to introduce the doctrine of sanctification? I am going to assume that your silence means assent and do that. So look at the sheet which you picked up this morning headed Sanctification in Puritan Theology. Um, and the first thing to say is that this outline which I'm now going to begin to elaborate is a generalization. I believe it's a fair generalization but it is a generalization, it isn't based on any single work, it's rather an expression of a consensus on which the Puritan pastors were very much agreed and which you have expounded in any number of different devotional writings. Uh, you won't be surprised to hear that the life of sanctification or holiness uh, was a major theme of Puritan preaching and uh, as I say the Puritans were very much of a mind in relation to all the themes that we're going to look at if you want to read a full length exposition of a Puritan uh, expressing the fullness of his mind on the aspects of sanctification well this book by Sinclair Ferguson on John Owen, John Owen on the Christian life, will give you that. And uh, I think that's still the fullest exposition of uh, the uh, sanctification as taught by a single theologian that you can get. There's, there's a lot about it, of course, in uh, Packer's Quest for Godliness. The theme keeps coming up in different chapters. Again, I think that the good way to begin will be to read from the Westminster Confession and the larger Catechism. Here is Westminster Confession, chapter 13. The title is of sanctification, uh, um, sorry, yes it is, of sanctification. I apologize to you, I needn't have done so, I just turned up the wrong page in my uh, Westminster document, my Westminster book. Listen to this. They who are once effectually called and regenerated, having a new heart and a new spirit created in them, are further sanctified, really and personally, through the virtue of Christ's death and resurrection, by his word and spirit dwelling in them. The dominion of the whole body of sin is destroyed, and the several lusts thereof are more and more weakened and mortified. And they, 
more and more quickened and strengthened in all saving graces to the practice of true holiness without which no man shall see the Lord. This sanctification is throughout in the whole man, yet imperfect in this life, there abiding still some remnants of corruption in every part. Whence arises a continual and irre irreconcilable war, the flesh lusting against the spirit and the spirit against the flesh. In which war, although the remaining corruption for a time may much prevail, yet through the continual supply of strength from the sanctifying spirit of Christ, the regenerate part doth overcome. And so the saints grow in grace, perfecting holiness in the fear of God. And now with that, set the answers to questions 75 and 78 in the larger catechism. Here's 75. Question. What is sanctification? Answer. Sanctification is a work of God's grace whereby they whom God hath before the foundation of the world chosen to be holy are in time through the powerful operation of his spirit applying the death and resurrection of Christ unto them renewed in their whole man after the image of God having the seeds of repentance unto life and all other saving graces put into their hearts. And those graces so stirred up, increased, and strengthened, as that they more and more die unto sin, and rise unto newness of life. The larger catechism is uh, what I call a higher catechism, the people whom the Westminster Divines envisaged as learning and uh, studying these definitions would be in their late teens or twenties or older than that. This is an adult catechism rather than a children's catechism and that's reflected by the fullness of the statement. Now question 80. Uh, sorry, it isn't 80, it's 78. Whence arises the imperfection of sanctification in believers? Answer. The imperfection of sanctification in believers ariseth from the remnants of sin abiding in every part of them, and the perpetual lustings of the flesh against the spirit, whereby they are often foiled with temptations and fall into many sins are hindered in all their spiritual services and their best works are imperfect and defiled in the sight of God. In other words, nothing in this world is perfect in any Christian's life. As I said yesterday, I think, the church is a hospital and we are all patients. We are getting better, we are helping each other to get better, but at no point are we well, I mean well without qualification, as yet. Getting better is the concept. And you have to remember, as you hear formulations like this, that when the Puritans looked at life and people's behavior, they weren't behaviorists like the uh, Pharisees in Jesus' day, whose thinking stopped short with performance, that is, outward action. They, the Puritans, this is, never forgot that the Lord looks on the heart, and when they look at their own performance and the performance of others, they must look on the heart also. The beginning of righteousness is in the heart with the motivation. So their first focus, um, uh, focus of attention 
uh, when they are looking at performance is on the motivation in the heart. And, they said, over and over again, if the motivation, well, say it this way, to the extent that the motivation in the heart is something less than actual love for God, actual gratitude for, to God, actual desire for the glory of God, an actual longing to please God, to that extent the performance is hollow and doesn't constitute full-scale righteousness. That was the lesson which Jesus tried in half a dozen different ways to bring home to the Pharisees and they never got it. They would not look on the heart. And as you know, there are many places in the Gospels where Jesus upbraids them for that. But the Puritans themselves had learned the lesson and when they thought about performance in the Christian life, they started with the heart. That's why you find them speaking uh, pretty emphatically about the real imperfection of the Christian's best works. In performance terms, um, people can do wonderfully well. I mean, some of us are jolly good actors. But the motivation is the thing that counts. And who can say that uh, from morning till night, uh, living as we do, the motivation of all our actions is all that it should be. So, that's the Puritan approach. It's uh, very inward in the way that it focuses on motivation. Uh, it, uh, it appeals, as we shall see in a moment, to the law of God setting standards of righteous performance but it never loses sight of the heart when it comes to assessing what people are up to. Insofar as there's a desire of the heart for holiness, well, that's a sign of sincerity and a sign indeed that the work of sanctification is making progress in this person's life, whoever it is. But to desire perfection is one thing and to achieve it is another. Here, just let me divert for a moment onto something which I shan't be able to elaborate, but I'd like to tell you about all the same. When it comes to the second half of Romans chapter 7, the Puritans, unlike modern expositors, have no problem at all. Paul is talking in the present tense, you remember, wretched man that I am, who shall deliver me from the body of this death? Um, I see another law in myself, warring against the law of my mind, bringing me into captivity to the law of sin in my members. I delight in the law of God after the inward man, but um, I'm not able to achieve the righteousness at which I aim. Well, for the Puritans, um, this is Paul at his best. Paul, that is, at his most sensitive spiritually. Paul able to see how far short of perfection, not just at performance level, but at motivational level, he's falling. Um, he longs for perfection and he finds that his reach exceeds his grasp. He's doing better, but he isn't perfect yet. And because he's a sensitive, ardent Christian soul, he can't be happy when his life is falling short of what he hoped to achieve and f falling short, he knows, of what would perfectly please God. So he's simply telling you his honest feelings when he says, wretched man that I am, who will deliver me from this body of death? And you know, um, or do you know, in Greek grammar, um, you are permitted to uh, suppress the verb 
in the next sentence, if it's going to be the same verb as in the last sentence, but you're to understand the verb in the same tense as it appeared in, in the last sentence. So, the answer you must understand in Paul's logic to the rhetorical question he asks, who will deliver me from this body of death, is, I thank God he will. That's my hope. That's part of my hope of glory. He will deliver me through Jesus Christ our Lord. And in the opening verses of Romans chapter 8, he comes back to that and looks forward to his hope of um, the quickening of the body in resurrection and the, um, the, the, the joy of being taken beyond this condition in which um, reach constantly exceeds grasp and Paul never does as well as he'd hoped to do. And then that explains the logic of the final words of Romans chapter 7. So then, this is Paul summarizing the way it is now, with my mind I serve the law of God, with my flesh I serve the law of sin. I wish it wasn't so, but uh, that's how it is. And said the Puritans, picking up on this, that's how it is for every real believer. Um, Paul is here, um, in, fa in, in, in fact, this isn't, what it, this isn't his purpose, of course. Um, his purpose is simply to uh, finish his argument in which he's distinguishing between the law and sin. He's saying the law hasn't got any sin in it, but the law does um, foment sin in our spiritual system. And the law, once it's stirred up sin, gives no power against it. Uh, that's the argument, and has been the argument since uh, Romans chapter 7, verse 7, as you can check up at your leisure any time. But in giving his testimony this way, Paul reveals how it actually is for him as a Christian. And the Puritans pick that up and run with it and say, it's just the same for all of us. And the church would be healthier today, I think, than it is if that point were more clearly seen and more emphatically stated. Well, that gets me right to the end of um, this, mo this morning's class. And I haven't got very far, have I, in my analysis of sanctification and the good fight of faith. Never mind. Next Monday morning, we'll dive into it and hope to get further with it. Meantime, I wish you a joyful weekend. The Lord bless you. You are dismissed.